see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Uh, hi, it's Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy, and today I'm here with uh, Mark Brackett. Uh, thanks, Mark, for joining me. You're welcome. And, uh, Mark, you're, uh, let me just get, I want to give a little bit of background about you. You're a research scientist at the Department of Psychology at Yale and uh, Dep uh, Deputy Director at Yale's Health, Emotion, and Behavioral Laboratory. And as I understand it, you're also head of the Emotional Intelligent Unit in the uh, Edward Ziegler Center in Child Development and Social Policy. That's correct. So, so what I want to talk about uh, in, in this uh, interview in dialogue is uh, one, hear about your work and how it relates to empathy and compassion, and then maybe mm -hmm. go into kind of ideas that you have about how can we uh, foster empathy and compassion uh, in our own lives and in, within society. So, um, so can you tell me a little bit about your work and how it relates to empathy and compassion? Sure. Um, so the work that I do is develop programs to teach children and adults involved in their education, including family members, uh, what we call social and emotional learning. And uh, the model that I've developed with my colleagues here at Yale, we call the RULER approach. And RULER stands for five critical skills that we want, as I say, everybody with a face to learn. And when I say everybody with a face, I mean everybody. So um, if I had it my way, it would be from womb to tomb. And uh, those five key skills are recognizing emotion in oneself and others. Uh, that includes facial expressions, body language, vocal tones, gestures. So that's the first R. The U stands for understanding where these emotions are coming from. Uh, so their causes, but also their consequences, how they influence our thinking, how they influence our judgments of ourselves and others how they affect our decision-making and behavior. The L stands for labeling, which has to do with developing a sophisticated vocabulary to describe, to describe that full range of emotion. Then the E is about expressing emotion. So what are the strategies that we use to express ourselves in ways that are communicating the messages in the way we intend? And then finally, the last R stands for regulation and uh, that has to do with the strategies that we use to both prevent emotions, our uncomfortable ones from occurring, reducing the ones that we don't want to have, initiating ones that we want to have, maintaining or keeping the ones that we want to have, or enhancing ones that we want to create. So that acronym RULER really encompasses quite a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of just a lot of skills. And what we've done in our uh, programming is develop tools to teach these ruler skills to, as I said, all adults and children in schools, including family members. And the idea behind ruler is that we have a theory behind it. Uh, there's a scientific model that asserts that people who have these developed skills live better lives. And uh, they live better lives because they're better able to connect with other people because they're reading them properly. They're able to connect better because they understand why people have particular feeling states. They can help people articulate and articulate their own. They express themselves so they don't hold emotions in. They're more comfortable with expressing the full range of emotions. And they have these strategies to regulate. And the, the processes by which this works is, one, you have this model and then you have uh, curricula that you embed in school systems from pre-K all the way up through high school, training for the adults. And the, the goal we have is to develop skills in the individual, but also change the actual climate. So to create a healthy emotional climate where people want to be and learn. And in turn, uh, our model asserts that when you do that, you'll have better quality relationships, you'll perform better academically, and your mental health will be better. Well, um, you were saying it, it, that the uh, five uh, steps are geared towards connection. And uh, for me, when I hear the word connection, I hear empathy, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we're, if we're connecting with each other, we're trying to empathize with each other. So how, do, how would those uh, five steps, the ruler steps, kind of relate to empathy, uh, you know, kind of specifically? Sure. So, you know, there are obviously many definitions of empathy. 
uh, but being able to feel for and with others is one critical piece of it. And uh, what we argue is that the ruler skills are antecedent. They're, they're the, um, what you need to have developed in order to be empathic. So it's, they're not empathy itself. What they are are the skills that you need to be more empathic. So, for example, if I am not skilled at reading your particular emotion states accurately, uh, it's going to be very difficult for me to be empathic because I'll misread you. I'll look at your neutral facial expression and say, what's wrong? Versus um, being uh, inquisitive and saying, you know, I'm not sure you know, how you're feeling right now, but maybe you could share with me what's going on for you. I'm a little, this, the messages are not that clear. Um, if you're misreading a child's sad face for um, disgust, uh, you're going to have a hard time being empathic towards that child because sadness is saying, I have a loss, I have a need that needs to be met. You're perceiving that child as being disgusted, which means, you know, I want to stay away from this kid or even angry. Um, so that's, that's the rationale, that's the underlying model. Uh, for, for the reading part. So I don't know if that was actually the actual situation that I was looking neutral and you were no, no, having no, no. a little trouble reading my neutrality or something. Was that no, a, no. a real experience? No, that, or? Was, that was a real, that, that, that's just an example oh, okay. uh -huh. of, how, of why the ability to read and recognize emotions from our perspective is critical to living a more empathic life. Uh -huh. And so the first part of the ruler is then kind of tools for learning how to read. Uh, exactly. Uh -huh. And maybe right. do you have a few steps within that process that what that you could outline? Well, we do. First is you have to build, you know, all the ruler skills are interlinked. So it's there, you can't, um, for example, it's very hard to articulate how you are feeling or how someone else is feeling without language. So the R in ruler coincides uh, with the L to to work together because the more nuanced your emotional vocabulary is the more articulate you can be about emotion states so if all you know is angry or all you know is sad it's not enough you know there's there's feeling down there's sadness there's disappointment there's despair there's hopelessness there's depression and uh, those emotion states look differently um, they look different so what we need to do is teach people uh, what those different emotion states look like and then the language associated with those states mm -hmm. so they're more skilled at recognizing them in themselves and others. Um, so what you're saying is like if I look within my own body, I mean we were actually we met at the Facebook uh, Compassion Conference and we were right. in, a, in a post circle there and I remember uh, that you actually said, well everyone, how do you feel right now? And then mm -hmm. you ask people to raise their hand, like, well, who can kind of articulate it? Like nobody, I don't know if they were just shy about doing it, but like nobody kind of raised their hand. No, it's very, very common. Uh, so it's like people don't have the vocabulary. They're not attuned to what's going on inside themselves and are no. able to say, well, I'm feeling a little bit of humor. I'm feeling a little bit of anxiety. I'm feeling a little bit of spaciousness. Um, and so to right. kind of articulate what's going on and be able to put that into words that you can share. So that's like exactly. one part that you're trying to do is is tune into yourself and then put a vocabulary to that. Correct. So for, and it's different for the self and for others because you're not necessarily looking at your own facial expressions, but what you're doing is paying attention to your own physiology and you're paying attention to your thought processes. Uh, you may be, you're, you'll be paying attention to your body language slightly if you become very attuned to emotions, right? You'll feel the tension in your shoulders or your hips, um, or you'll feel the, in the not tight neck, or you'll feel your eyebrows all furrowed and crunched up. Or when you're smiling, you know, you'll feel the crow's feet popping out of your face and, you know, the brightness in your, in your smile. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a complex set of processes, right? You're, it's, it's about facial expressions, body postures, that you're listening to your own vocal tone, uh, your intonations when you're speaking. Um, it's paying attention to your heart rate and your, your, your respiration, uh, your breathing. Uh, so it's a complex uh, set of processes that help us to be more skilled at recognizing emotion. And then we want to put all that together with language so that we can articulate more clearly these emotional experiences. So if you were doing that right now as a sample, if you're scanning through your own body, how would you right now in this moment kind of articulate what's going on in your body? 
So for me, um, you know, I'm sitting at my desk. Uh, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, I'm being interviewed about empathy, which is a lovely thing. Uh, no one's complaining about the grant proposal that had, you know, grammatical errors. Uh, um, so for me, my body's at ease. You know, my uh, my heart rate is quite low. So we have a we we use a tool called the mood meter uh, to help us understand where we are in terms of our moods and emotions. And uh, there are four quadrants in the mood meter. The yellow is bright energy, lots of activation, and high pleasantness. The green is pleasant but low in energy. The blue is low energy with unpleasantness, and the red is high energy, high activation with lots of unpleasantness. So for me right now, I'm in the green, uh, which is um, my activation level is quite low. Uh, I'm not doing a presentation. I'm just sitting here being interviewed, so it's very relaxing. Uh, have a glass of water, just had a cup of coffee, and uh, heart rate is pretty slow. Um, not much going on in my surroundings because my office door is closed and I shut my telephone off. Okay. Um, and that's part of, I mean, you know, you, you'd mentioned about the definition of empathy and there's, you know, there's a lot of different definitions, uh, academics, the scholars kind of use the word mm -hmm. uh, differently. And for, maybe I could just recount real quickly what my definition of is. I okay. see empathy as four parts. There's a self-empathy, which is sensory awareness, uh, mindfulness of what's going on in my body. So it's very similar to what you're mm -hmm. talking about. Yeah. And that we need that to actually to tap into, to be aware of what's going on and to be able to read. Uh, the second part is uh, mirrored empathy through its mirror neurons. So as I'm, you know, as you're shaking your head, you know, I'm kind of feeling, you know, my mm -hmm. mirror neurons, you're smiling, right. you're, you're, you know, you're, I, I'm feeling and you're, you're moving the, the, the drinking the water. I'm, you know, feeling what it might be like to, to do, to <laughs> have that. Uh, water, you know, go down your throat, you know, you can feel kind of the coolness a little bit. So that would be the mirror neurons. And then there's kind of like the, the imaginative empathy, which is the perspective taking or the something called cognitive empathy, whereas we mm -hmm. take someone else's position, almost like an actor. Uh, and then the fourth part is empathic action, which is that as we kind of resonate with each other and really kind of get attuned, that we want to kind of contribute to each other's well-being. If you're like happy, mm -hmm. I want you to be even happier. You know, if it's so. Um, and I see that in uh, conflict resolution. You know, two parties are all mad and pissed off at each mm -hmm. other. You kind of help them. Uh, you empathize with them. You get them mm -hmm. dialoguing with each other. They get into this empathic resonance where mm -hmm. they understand each other, and then they naturally want to kind of create some kind of resolution to their problem. Sure. And I call that empathic action. So, how mm -hmm. does that kind of resonate with your understanding of of, of empathy and how you're using it? I think it, um, it resonates well. Um, I wouldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we would maybe you know we use different vocabulary to describe these things. Uh, you know, the argument whether empathy is a psychological state or a behavior is complicated, right? So you're, you're, you're taking it from the inner to the outer. Um, some, some people might call, you know, empathy as the psychological piece and then pro-social behavior as the outcome. Um, you know, you can get, obviously, you can go nuts with this kind of... <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. And in the end, you know, it's sort of like, can't just people, do, can't everybody just be nice to each other? Uh-huh. Uh, the um but i know i would agree with you you know wholeheartedly you know that there's obviously the pieces that we're talking about that are similar are this psychological sort of and physical awareness uh of self and and other um in terms of the so your first one was sort of what did you call the first one i call it self empathy so that's the sure. sensory awareness of what's going on it's very it's very related to what you're talking about that it's sure. a need to connect to our what's going on inside of ourselves to start right. with um, you know self empathy i might think of in terms of more of acceptance of all emotion states you know if i were to take that language and use it in my own world um, which is obviously a big part of our work that all emotions are valid Mm. You know, that just because you're angry or you're s disappointed, um, there's nothing that's a natural state. Emotions are natural kinds. 
but the it's what we do with our emotions right when we're when we're really angry and not psychologically aware of it that it tends to influence our behaviors in different ways mm -hmm. and when we don't have the strategies so a big part of our work is really helping people strategize and and have that self-talk or use that reappraisal technique to um, when they're, you know, when you go for the, when you, when, if you were to say something that would offend me, let's say, and I got activated and became pissed, um, how do I immediately reframe that or use a self-talk strategy to say, wait a minute, you know, he's not out to attack me here. That's my own stuff from all the past or whatever the case. There's lots of obviously issues in there. Um, then there's the, the third piece. What was the second of yours? Um, be well, before we do that, so what I was kind of hearing here, the first part is that all emotions are valid and you don't want to be judging them or trying to suppress them, but you're really wanting to be aware of all uh, emotions. And then you're kind of finding, looking for strategies of, of uh, how to relate to them in a more positive right. way without kind of trying to suppress them. But... Yeah, well, that, the empathy that what I would say, you know, in terms of being empathic towards the self is not judging oneself or feeling angry or bad about oneself for having unpleasant emotions. So some of it is programmed from things that we're not even aware of, you know, from childhood experiences. Um, and I've noticed even in myself, you know, oftentimes I have an automatic negative attribution towards something, but I don't act on that attribution. You know, I, I, I've grown quite a bit you know, over the years and, and have some more self-awareness than I used to have. So I can say, wait a minute, you know, where is this coming from? Like, let it go. Don't say what you want to say. Your gut feeling is to go for the jugular right now, but don't do it because you'll regret it later. And also, like, where, what is the need for that? Um, what is that? How is that going to help you feel better about yourself? How is that going to help you with your relationship? How is that going to help you achieve your goals? Likely it won't do any of those three things, so eat it and, mm -hmm. and, and process it later. Oh, so you're kind of creating more space then for yourself. Correct. Then it's like, oh, here's this thing. Instead of, you know, me getting into a fight about it, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to like, you know, breathe, kind of create some space. Uh, and then what's the next, exactly. what's the next step then for... So we have a technique that my colleague Robin Stern, uh, who is a psychoanalyst and an educator, developed. And we call it the meta moment. And it is our primary tool for building self-awareness and compassion and self-regulation. And there are six steps to the meta moment process. And the first is that self, knowing that you have this trigger, so something happens. And being really aware of, you know, like when a student comes into my office who looks schleppy, you know, that really just gets under my skin. Or when somebody hands me an assignment that is incomplete, you know, that's a trigger point for me, or whatever the case might be. Uh, and then it's, you know, you know, they're all, it's all context and role specific. So, you know, my relationship with my partner is very different than my relationship with my students. Uh, so it's differentiating those. Uh, then the second piece is what we call sensing. And sensing has to do with really noticing how that trigger automatically shifted your cognitive processes automatically shifted the way you're approaching that person or avoiding that person in terms of your gestures and posture and physical facial expressions and also thinking about in terms of how you're now all of a sudden you're, you're red in the face and your heart is racing faster. So it's that cognitive, physiological and expressive piece of emotions. The third is when you would just talk about breathing and just allowing yourself to become deactivated through some, some, through some very slow, deep breaths. Um, the fourth piece is the key element of the meta moment, uh, which we call the best self. So what we do is we train people to see their best self. And some people need to develop that best self because they haven't even thought about it. And the best self, from our perspective, has three uh, components. It's how you ideally want to see yourself and feel in the situation. It's how you would like others to see you in terms of your reputation and relationship. And third, it's what is the ideal outcome for the situation? So, for example, a student comes into my office, someone who I have this brain mindset that they're going to be highly competent and really whippersnapper, 
and a person comes in and says, you know, here's my paper, and I start reading it, and I'm like, oh my God, this is awful. And I just want to, like, my immediate, my biological, from my ancestors, <laughs> is activated, and I'm just like, get out of my face. This is, like, awful. I can't stand you. You're wasting my time because um, I didn't meet my expectations, blah, blah, blah. So that's a trigger. Boom. And then I'm noticing my thoughts are like, I'm having this negative thought like, this person is not that bright. This per- Why did I hire this person? <laughs> a decision maker. Mm. Right? I'm getting activated. And then I say, all right, Mark, stop. Take that breath. And then I say, okay, so here you are in a meeting with a student. You're a professor. What does the ideal professor do in this situation? What does the ideal professor want his, for me, reputation to be after this meeting is over? Do I want this woman who is my student or faculty, whoever it is, leaving here saying, I hate this guy, he's a jerk, he's supposed to be the feelings master, but he's actually a, you know, blah, 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 he's full of it. Um, And then also, what do I want for her in terms of the outcome of this work? You know, do I want her to hate her job and hate the product? And so, and that's a lot of stuff to take care Mm -hmm. of in one And that's why, you know, this needs a lot of practice. Um, And you need to be more proactive about using this technique. And then after that whole piece of, of the, what we, what, we are, what we assert is that by shifting your mindset to the Jekyll versus the Hyde, um, meaning the, the positive mindset, what it allows you to choose and use more effective strategies. So what I'll do is I will now reframe and say, well, you know, I, I forgot, you know, she's, she's from the Philippines and she hasn't been here for many years. When I read this paper for, for where she is in her career, this English is actually pretty damn good. Um, or um, maybe I'm just missing something here. Maybe we had a miscommunication. So I'm using some kind of self-talk or some kind of reframing, and that in turn guides my behavior in that moment. So we argue that the meta moment is that space and time uh, between the stimulus and response, and what we need to do is prolong that space in the beginning so we can manage it more effectively. And uh, a big part of the meta moment process that we uh, assert is that you have to be deliberate. So when we when we work with educators, for example, we have them think about their triggers, and then they can use they can create the meta moment process in advance, so that when they're faced with that obstacle, boom, they have a script and they have um, a way of managing it, so that they can practice it proactively. Because it's a lot harder when you're caught off guard, right? Yeah. You know, you're in a meeting. I've had this recently where uh, a guru, supposedly in my field, of, who is an em- expert on empathy, supposedly, now I can't mention who this person is, um, came, was at a meeting, and um, I said, any questions, and boom, this person's hand went up like that. And, and then um, the comment was, you know, a lot of us in the room would disagree with this, you know. And of course, I was irritated, you know, it was... And, uh, you know, my immediate gut response is going to be a lot of us, like you and your 30 personalities. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go there because, you know, that's not what the meta moment process has taught me. You know, I just, I noticed all that. My negative thought was go for the jugular the mark, rip this person to shreds, you can do it. And then the, the best self came out and said, all right, wait a minute here. You know, you're, you're supposedly the guru of social and emotional learning. Do what that person would do. How would that person react to the situation? And that helps reprogram you to respond more proactively and pro-socially. So anyway, I'm just giving you some examples of of what we do. And we teach children from kindergarten all the way up through high school and beyond how to do this technique. Well, it's, it's that meta moment, what you're saying, it's kind of a spacious moment where instead of like just engaging in that conflict or or whatever it is that kind of sets you off, you're trying to create space around that so that uh, you can kind of work with it more uh, effectively. And, and for me, the, you know, I was talking about the uh, second part, which you'd asked about, is mirrored empathy. So it's, right. it's kind of like, how do we kind of connect more deeply in terms of that resonance, that emotional resonance with, with each other? And uh-huh. then maybe in that space, it allows for more of that, uh, you know, those mirror neurons to kind of tune into each sure. other or something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it. Uh, the problem, you know, is that, you know, it's easy to be empathic towards people that you like and who have 
nice face, they don't make nice facial expressions and they're, you know, they validate you and you validate them. It's when you're in those moments, like when I was with this person whose face looked like, you know, an eagle would look at a squirrel, you know, and is, is out for the out for the attack. You know, you don't want to mirror that. You know, you want to counter that. Yeah. And uh, so that's where it becomes, I think, more complicated. You know, my goal, you know, I don't, I don't want to mirror her negativity. What I want to do is, and I, need, I want to do a lot of things. I want to first preserve my own well-being. You know, secondly, I, I don't want this person to have so much power over me. You know, because that's a lot of times what people like that want. They want to have that control and power. So I think what you're talking about works really well in good quality relationship instances. However, when you're faced with that um, that real negative stimulus, uh, it becomes more challenging, and that's when you've got to sort of take you know, you know, almost like the higher order self, right? You 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 know, uh, and uh, and and not allow that person to in many ways, sabotage your own empathic self. Yeah. Well, with that, I would imagine for me in, in that situation, I would feel kind of like I was being intimidated and I would feel start feeling fearful, right? It's like going to be yeah. made to look stupid or something. Uh -huh. and, and then I feel myself kind of like shrink emotionally. Which is awful. Yeah, right? it's a painful feeling. I feel alienated at that point. And, you know, my presence is, you know, and then I want to kind totally. of lash back and, you know, exactly. punch back. You're going to punch me, I'm going to punch you. <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, exactly what happened in that particular experience. I went, I, had, I was on a train ride, you know, and I realized that I was being bullied, you know, and I was like, wow, here I am at 43, you know, being bullied. And like, you know, I was a kid who was bullied. So, you know, I, I, I pick up on those cues quite quickly and, and I'm affected by them really quickly. So, you know, it was, and it was one of, you know, but I'm a little different. Now I have a fifth degree black belt in the martial arts and, you know, I have a, a, a pretty solid career, you know, at a, at a good institution. So I'm not that kid who is sort of powerless and, and you know, insecure. Uh, but nevertheless, it had the same impact on me. And, uh, but I also decided that, as you know, here's an interesting thing, and this is something that we really talk about quite a bit, is that the meta moment also is not just about dealing with um, uncomfortableness in terms of uh, managing yourself, but it's also uh, sometimes be, sometimes the best self is a self that is not being taken advantage of, right? You're doing the best thing for yourself and for the world and the community by not allowing that person to have that power over you. And that's tough, particularly when you come from circumstances where you were powerless in many instances. Yeah, if we're talking about a culture of empathy, um, that moment where you become fearful and shrink, you're kind of going into a culture of uh, fear and, and yeah. culture of anxiety and a culture of dominance. And, and, exactly. uh, and you want to maintain the connection with the other person which would be for me, I would call that the culture of empathy is maintaining a sense mm -hmm. of connection with the other person. And by doing that, you're, you're influencing the overall culture as well. It yeah, is what I'm hearing. That's kind of, uh -huh. Yeah, I agree. But there are some people, you know, with whom you can't have that connection, unfortunately, when we try our best. But this is where, you know, clinical psychology is, comes in handy. Uh, because if the person has a personality disorder, mm -hmm. You know, you can do all you want to try to change that person, but their rigidity and their mind, you know, is is made up. Uh, you know, you can bring this person into all these different places, but they really need serious reprogramming. And uh, so sometimes the most empathic thing you can do is remove yourself from the situation. Well, there's, there's plenty of people who have grown up in very unempathic environments and their kind of their mm -hmm. resilience and their grounding is is such i mean a friend of mine just went into kind of deep depression was actually institutionalized mm. and it's like he's in this in this space where he's having trouble kind of crawling you know working mm -hmm. his way out of it and it's it's not just a thing that he can do right yeah. away it's like it take you know we, we go running uh i go running with him and and uh you know it's just try to be there try to be present and it, it takes mm -hmm. takes a long time to it does 
You have to have some self-compassion and self-empathy. You know, it's tough. Yeah, I gave him Kristen Neff's uh, self-compassion book. <laughs> so, so the problem is he can't pick it up to read it. No, that's true. He's he's uh, he kind of leaves through it. It's having that energy to actually even get into yeah. it is a problem. And how do you kind of you know deal with that? So. So continuing with um, kind of your work in empathy, uh, we kind of talked about the first, uh, you know, the R and the L part yeah. of connecting. How about the other components? How do they relate yeah. to empathy? So the U, which is understanding of emotion, you know, is getting at, you know, knowing that when you are in a particular emotion state, you're less likely to be empathic, for example. You know, so, you know, if I'm really angry at my partner, I know that I really have to just go take a walk because if I continue to stay in the situation, it's not going to be a good result for us. Um, it's knowing, um, it's understanding that when I look at your facial expression and you look sad, that that is a signal that you need help. It's, it's, it's the knowledge. It's, it's it's the um, it's making the it's making sense out of the emotion state. Then the E, which is critical, is knowing how to say things. Right? You know, you know, um, you know. What is the worst thing, worst thing a parent does? Right? Mommy, I'm feeling sad. No, you're not. <laughs> uh -huh. you <know? laughs> yeah, dis right? discounting it or dismissing exactly. it, and it's it's not true. Yeah. Or, you know, if I notice that you look sad right now, I might say something like. You know what's wrong you know where that makes you feel worse you know so it's knowing it's being sensitive to sensitive about how you communicate about emotion and knowing how to do that both in written form and then obviously uh, you know through the spoken word um, and then finally the the last R in ruler is regulation so what do we do to regulate? You know, so if when you're feeling down, do I just give you the book and say, here's, the, you know, here's your book, good luck? You know, that wouldn't be empathic. Even though giving a book might be effective, um, you know, it's the way you give the book, it's the way you talk about the book, it's the uh, expectations that you create around it. So that's where all the roller skills come together. Um, it's knowing that your self-talk can't be something like, I hate myself, I'm a loser, it's got to be something that's, you know, I think I can, I think I can, um, or I'm not going to let this person have that much control over me. You know, I've, I've, I've really made it in my life. Why am I allowing this person to have so much power over me? So you have to, you know, it's, it's training on the right things to think about or the, the most effective things to think about for you as an individual. It's teaching people what strategy they need. So, you know, we make assumptions that, because I like to talk on the telephone when I'm de feeling depressed, um, that everybody does. And that's not the case. You know, we have to help people choose and use strategies that work for them based on their history and based on their personality. So these are strategies that maintain empathic connection or foster empathic sure. connection. So you're kind of going like, from my past experiences, kind of what's worked and kind of remembering those, mm -hmm. those ways that have worked and... Okay. But learning, learning though, okay. learning that there are myriad strategies, you know, self-mutilation, not good, you know, <laughs> you know, self-talk, if it's positive, good, uh, rumination, not good, um, you know, going out socializing, good, going out socializing, getting drunk, not good. Uh -huh. So it's you know, really learning a lot of learning those different approaches. So, exactly. So you've really kind of, it, the sense I'm getting is you've really broken things down into kind of step by step. Uh, processes mm -hmm. and you're kind of like going through and and uh, how things work and you're kind of teaching that uh, pro that that uh, process that um, and with that awareness and those skill building that you can kind of create more kind of like an environment of, of empathy and and connection That's, yes mm -hmm. so teaching and what we've shown in our research is that schools that adopt this approach uh, do have classrooms that demonstrate more empathy so their classrooms have what we call a, a greater emotional climate. There's more emotional supportiveness in the classroom. So teachers regard their students' perspectives uh, more after using our approach. Um, they're more sensitive to their students' needs. 
Uh, teachers display more positive emotions while teaching. They're less cynical and sarcastic. Um, all the things that we'd want to have. And what we know about that is that helps to create more um, greater student engagement. When students are engaged, guess what? They learn more because they feel connected. They're bonding more with their teachers. So we would like to apply these concepts into this academic setting so that there's a value to developing it. You know, if you develop these skills with your students, they're going to be more engaged. They're going to feel more connected to you. They're going to bully less. They're going to be less. They're going to be more cooperative. They're going to, and then they're, what you need in terms of the way the world works now in, in, in education is you're going to have students who just perform better. Uh, I just interviewed uh, Catherine Lee at our local school here. It's uh, ah, okay. Sierra P Pacific Sierra. Uh, Pro Prospect Sierra. Prospect Sierra. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and that's right here in El Cerrito. It's like just blocks uh, from where I live. And she mentioned that they're actually implementing uh, the ruler approach there. And she said, I guess you've actually worked with her and, and been I here. I am. I'll be there, I'll be there uh, in two weeks. Actually. Oh, really? Oh, we have to get yeah. together. It's, only, it's just blocks away. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they're actually, they seem to be very much at the cutting edge of, you know, trying a lot of different processes, and it's really great. They're, they're, a, they're really a, a wonderful school. I'm, I'm honored to be working with them. Okay, well, okay, so, you know, it's like, uh, if we look at it kind of, well, let's, let's, I've been asking people about uh, another way is kind of learning personally about the people I, you know, talk with. And so I'm wondering, mm -hmm. for you personally, what's your most important value in life? If there was like one value that's kind of like the most important, what's the most important? Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, uh, I would guess that the most important thing is authenticity. Uh, is just being uh, real and present. Uh, present is hard for me because I'm I have uh, quite a lot of attention problems. I'm because my brain is just not never not working. Um, so if there's like a second I have, I'm going to want to check my email, or I'm going to want to do something else. So I, <laughs> focusing is, is tough for me uh -huh. sometimes. I noticed that as we were starting this, I was kind of <laughs> setting things up and you were busy, you know, working your way on things. I said, what is this guy doing? <laughs> well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I can, you know, yeah. I have three minutes to get something done. Yeah, it's, it's, that's really great to hear, hear it afterwards. You know, I was wondering what that was about and this is what yeah. it's about. So it's that focusing, it's a little hard to kind of focus and... But the authenticity is the, the important yeah, one. Yeah, so, like, you know, it's very critical to me. Um, I'm just in a world where so many people uh, are not their true self, right? And uh, so for me, it's always trying my best to be as authentic as possible. And uh, not no pretense, you know. Uh-huh. How did that? How did that become a value uh, for you? Is there like a story of you know through your life, like were some moments like where you had like, oh, I, this is really important to me. You know, is there some anecdotes or stories? It's just been. It's always. It's ongoing to me. You know, as uh, for example, you know, my uh, as I do a lot of presenting, and my goal is always to connect with my audience. And I have to be authentic to do that, uh, from my perspective. And you know, because I work at a prestigious university, oftentimes people think of me in a in a way, in a way that I wouldn't want them to think of me. So you know, I'm not going to be able to relate to you. You know, what do you know about the poor kids in the Bronx? You work at a you know, at an Ivy League university, and you know, the last thing I ever want is for someone to feel less than or, um, or incapable of connecting with me um, and uh, so anyway I work hard at, at, at being authentic and also making sure that I communicate in a way that makes people feel valued and supported and appreciated not in a way that makes them feel alienated or disconnected mm. yeah that's like a cardinal piece of my work um, and uh, it doesn't I mean I give an example of where you know uh, you know, I had the low, I have the edge or, or the the the, um, the upper hand, but you know, because I'm around, you know, very smart people, a lot who are sometimes very famous. You know, I watch the way they interact and I watch the way they connect with people, and you know, it, it sometimes I'm just really disappointed, you know, and, and it makes me feel like, 
what is their underlying need, you know, to make people feel like they are better than, um, you know, and I would say the other thing is gratitude for me, uh, because I, I come from, you know, very lower middle class, working class background. My, you know, neither one of my parents went to college. And for some reason or another, I have two brothers. All of us have doctorates. And uh, we still to this day, you know, have dinner with each other and say, you know, how did we get this drive? How did we get this motivation? Where did it come from? You know, how the heck did we accomplish, you know, these, this level of education without having parents who knew anything about it, mm. you know? Um, and I just, you know, feel grateful every day for being in a position that I'm in. And, you know, obviously the more successful I am, the more quote-unquote power I have in terms of talking about my work and the more people listen to you, you know, so you want your messages to be authentic and clear um, because you have a moral responsibility. Uh, you know, every, you know, when I do a presentation or a training in a school, I've got, you know, hundreds of schools using my programs now. So I feel very responsible uh, for how the work gets disseminated, you know, and the messages that are being sent out there. Yeah, so, well, the first one was the authenticity is kind of just being, I guess that's just being who you are without the pretense and that the, yeah. <clears throat> in the academic, since you're at Yale and, you know, it's, you got the PhD and, you know, some people kind of distance themselves kind of and, right. and kind of want the accolades and all that. And, and it becomes like a disconnection between people that aren't feeling kind of the, the emotion or something between mm -hmm. us doesn't come through. So it, it's that sense of authenticity in that sense. Uh, how does that then, how, does, how do you see authenticity relating to empathy? I think it's there. I think it's, it's, a part, it's, in, it's, it's in it because um, you can't connect with other people unless you're being authentic. In my view, yeah, you know, and um, people read through it so quickly, right? The face leaks, so you know when you're, you know, I, I'm, 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 a, and then one of the things I'm always blamed by everybody who works with me that I, if I'm not interested or on board, you know, I completely disconnect and it's, you know, I'm being rude, I'm being obnoxious, and da da da, you know, it's a whole thing. And I, so I've really worked hard, even if like one of the things that I do now is when I have meetings, I make them shorter. So that you know, I know I can focus for the meeting, uh -huh. uh, and uh, but you know, it's I've gotten a lot of feedback, and that's another big piece of my work is valuing feedback, being really open to uh, to the way I present myself, and because uh, again, the last thing I want to be seen as is is a non you know someone who's not compassionate or you know empathic. So I think authenticity is pretty critical to it because it's it's your it's what you reveal in 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 your in your environment and it's and when you're not authentic it's really easy to see. Yeah. I you know. Yeah. Well the the authenticity is that um I think uh it's kind of like the more I can share and be authentic it kind of creates a space for others to yeah. see that, and it, it it allows for the deepening of the of the empathic mm -hmm. connection that we it can kind of go deeper and deeper. So, um, it's uh, you know it's it's that uh, it's that component of, of empathy. Of uh, I'm sometimes when I interview people, I ask them, "Well, tell me a story," and they can't think of a story, and I'll share a story that comes to me, and it's because I'm sharing the story. It kind of created space for them. To, uh -huh. Oh, I think I have it. So I can, yeah. I see that as kind of the the importance of authenticity to uh, totally. Well, and it's also you know, it, and uh, empathy takes time. Right, it takes time. Yeah. It takes commitment. It takes resources, and sometimes you, um, you know, I'm busy, so you know, it's it's it's, it's sometimes a really interesting dy dynamic, you know, where uh, because I have so much going on in my you know daily life in, in terms of work, and you know, one person comes into your life and you want to be able to connect with that person, and maybe they have some something wrong, or you want to help them out but you really just don't have the time to spend, it creates this really weird space inside of you. Mm. You know, and, and I've had that happen. What's interesting for me professionally is, you know, 15 years ago I was living in New York City and working in coffee shops and writing in coffee shops and everybody who I knew was depressed and anxious <laughs> and 
you know, it was a whole Havana Gila, you know, of like emotions every day. Like, I can't write, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, da da da. And I would spend hours, you know, it's going to be okay, we'll talk about it, it's temporary, you know, let's take a walk in the park. Um, and now, you know, I just don't have that leisure. And um, so it's been interesting for me in terms of my own relationships that I've, I've sort of narrowed my relationships to, you know, because it's, 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 it's you know, if you want to be authentic and you want to have quality relationships it, it's it's effort and time and uh so it's an interesting dynamic yeah you know, it's complex yeah if you're really busy i mean there's those studies about the seminarians who are rushing to give their talk on on the good samaritan and then they place someone in between there who's in need and they they're so busy they just pass it by and yeah you know we shut down we get i mean i feel it too if i get really bad i shut down it it takes all doing all that work is something that seems to shut down empathy in in some ways too, when you're kind of overwhelmed with all the work and yeah yeah totally, but there's you know there's there's that you have to like there's like you know it's complicated you know because you know I've 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 closed not closed but I'm less involved in many of my friendships than I used to be, um, but I also feel you know, the greater good is coming mm -hmm. out of the work I'm doing, mm -hmm. you know. So I maybe I'm not as close with three or four people as I was, but now I've, you know, our programs have now reached over a million kids. So, you know, it's a, it's, you have to, you know, you have to do what's right for you and also what's authentic. Because now if I have the choice to, you know, work on my book or hang out with a friend, I will often 99% of the time choose to work on my book. Mm -hmm. Because it does give me more personal gratification, mm -hmm. and uh, so again, that's about you know I I, I wouldn't want to be with my friend thinking about writing my book. Well, that wouldn't be a good friend. Well, there was one other uh, question someone ha wanted me to ask yeah. was actually about uh, empathy and competition, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of similar to you know, being busy too, right? It's like when you're busy, you're, you're, you don't have as much time for the, you know, the interaction. But what about, yeah. have you looked at that, uh, the, the relationship? Because schools are often, you know, built around competition, your yeah. competition for grades. Is that something you've thought about? I mean, we've certainly thought about, you know, competition, how it creates stress and alienation and things of that sort. I haven't given as much attention to, you know, the role of, you know, empathy in there. But, you know, I guess by definition, you know, corporate America is anti, you know, antipathy, right? Because it's about, it's about me achieving and going up the vertical ladder. Uh, so, um, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon. You know, can you, can you both get along and get ahead? And, you know, there's some psychologists that have talked about those are some of the fundamental needs that people have, right? Getting along, getting ahead. But they compete with one another. Uh, so it is complex. Yeah. It is, you know, it is, and, you know, one thing that, you know, what's complex about it, you know, is, you know, if you have a need for achievement, you know, it, it's just a need. You know, it's a strong need. And uh, just because you... Are competitive and want to be the best at something doesn't mean that you can't be empathic. Yeah. The problem is that the person who may not be as good as you will always think of you as not being <laughs> empathic. So um, it is tough. I, I, I don't know the I don't know the answer to that. I have to I'd have to really mull it over for a while. Yeah. And I probably still wouldn't have the answer, but I would like to. It, it's a nice it's a nice question to think about. Yeah, I don't have the answer either, but it's something I'd really like wanting to kind of explore because I see it come up a lot. Um, it does. You know, because our society seems to be built on competition, competition within the government, and mm -hmm. it seems to be re somewhat dysfunctional. You know, the, the legal system seems to be based on competition. You, know, you have mm -hmm. two lawyers competing it out versus a restorative, you know, uh, justice type of process, which I would think is more empathic. So. Mm -hmm. It's kind of one of the areas I'm kind of looking at. 
So, um, okay, uh, one kind of other question is, I like to look at metaphors for empathy. Um, mm -hmm. So a metaphor, I mean, empathy is often described as the metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes, looking through someone else's eyes. Mm -hmm. And for me, empathy is like a cornucopia in the sense that it's, uh, you know, there's this rich kind of experience of, that kind of happens as I open up and connect with others. So I'm wondering if you have a metaphor of what empathy is like for you personally, like your own creative metaphor. Wow, that's a, you, 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 this is not a good way to end. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to like, stump uh, you. Sometimes the scientists have the hardest part with, with the, the metaphors. It's kind of the artists tend to, you know, are good with uh, the metaphor. Yeah, I love metaphors, but I haven't ever thought about um, the metaphor for me in terms of what empath empathy might mean. Um, yeah, nothing. The, the only no. thing... The only thing that's coming to mind, you know, is is uh, is the you know the one that you mentioned that's so commonly used. Uh, so I'm stuck there. I'm okay. Gonna, I, yeah. I, I, well, I don't, I don't, I'll I, come back I can't, to you. I can't. Uh -huh. I, can't, I, can't I can't just give a superficial answer uh -huh. to that one. Oh, you want, you're wanting a deep, a deep metaphor, a deep resonating metaphor, yeah. not a kind I of mean, a the superficial. Thing that's coming to, the thing that's the thing that's coming to mind is just you know, the hugging. But uh -huh. uh, that for some reason that's that's my mind went immediately to bonding with someone in terms of authentic. You know the, uh, you notice when you hug someone. There's that real hug that you feel the connection, mm. and there's the hugs that people give you where it's sort of like you know the little tap on the back, which is the, uh, you know the I call it the uh, the, the you know the L.A. kind of hug, right? Uh -huh. um, so that that's all that came to mind for me right now. Uh, so empathy is like a deep, a deep hug. Uh -huh. Then uh -huh. that real, uh, it's the it's the idea of the of really not being uncomfortable with connecting it's sort of intimacy uh, it doesn't have to be obviously um, sexual but it's the idea of um, of not being uncomfortable with being connected uh -huh. it's that kind of that deep kind of melting kind of a hug then yeah. empathy is like the deep maybe it's selflessness in that interaction uh -huh. sort of uh, but yet demonstrating that you're fully present. Uh huh. Oh, great. <laughs> well, I, I love metaphor. I have a lot of fun with metaphor, so I wanted to get that in. So, uh, is there any kind of final thoughts you have that uh, about uh, that you'd like to share? No, I with? think what you're doing. I think this is a great um, thing you're doing for the community, and uh, I'm honored and appreciative to for being interviewed. Oh, thank you, Mark. So. Uh, I really appreciate it as well, and I can just feel your ease, and it's really a real pleasure to uh, to uh, talk thank to you. you. So thank you, uh, Mark, for taking the time to uh, yeah, you're have welcome. chatted with me about and, this. And uh, I'll see you in El Cerrito. Yeah, great. Well, I'll send you an email with uh, my contact info. Maybe get a cup of coffee up there or something. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm doing a number of presentations at the Prospects here at school. Maybe you can come to oh, one of them. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, great. I'm doing a whole thing with parents uh, on, I think, Thursday night the 20 something of, of September so 2012 okay so yeah we're at now great um yeah definitely All right. see you see you there then mark thanks All right, again thanks again bye-bye see the world through other people's eyes now empathy is a quality of character that can change the world